a uh, pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker for today, uh, Chris Payne. Um, he is trained as an architect. Um, he lives in New York City, and he is now doing a lot of photography and um, is, um, has authored his second book, which is this, and which is, has the same title as his talk for today. Um, so if you want to take a look at this um, before you leave, you can do so, and those are available in um, bookstores to, to purchase. Um, I also think that what's great is that Chris uh, recently received the Ken Book Award from New York City, um, or the New York chapter of uh, NAMI, so that was a great honor for him. And um, I don't want to take up any more of the time, I want to get to this great talk, so please join me in welcoming uh, Chris Payne. Thank you. Let me get. So, we we all think of, of mental hospitals as snake pits, places of, of nightmarish squalor and abuse, and this is certainly how they have been portrayed in the film and media. We can all think of uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. But as with every story, there are two sides, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the other side of the story. And so I'm going to begin with a little bit of, of history, talk about the, uh, the forces that brought these institutions, these asylums into being, uh, the incredible architecture which was created for them, how they functioned as self-contained communities, their ultimate demise, and then I'm going to segue into uh, kind of a, a trip through these buildings, uh, show, you, show you them the way I saw them between 2002 and 2008 when I visited approximately 70 state hospitals all over the country in 30 states, many of which are represented in this book. So to begin, um, we will begin with the, let me take a, a drink of water here. Uh, we'll begin with the hospital that I first saw, the hospital that started this project for me, which was Pilgrim State Hospital uh, outside of New York City. And in 1928, the state of New York purchased a thousand acres in central Long Island, about an hour west of, uh, hour east of, of New York City to build the world's largest mental hospital. The four other hospitals in the New York area uh, had become overcrowded and Pilgrim with its 10,000 new beds and state-of-the-art facilities was meant to provide much needed relief. The thing I like about this photograph is that, and it dates from 1933, is that uh, you know, they weren't just building a few buildings. They were building an entire campus, an entire city from the ground up. And this is all farmland. If you go there now, the hospital is, is kind of enclosed by the suburbs. Well, by the 1950s, Pilgrim had indeed grown into a small city with a population of over 14,000 patients. Now, not, uh, not far to the south on that parkway there was Central Islip State Hospital. That was the third largest hospital in the state. And if you kept going on that same parkway just north, you would get to Kings Park, which is the second largest uh, mental hospital in the state. Combined, they had a, a patient population of over 33,000 people, making this little stretch of Long Island the mental hospital capital of the world. This is an interesting diagram that I found, and, and as an architect, it's, you know, it's very architectural, uh, it's diagrammatic, and I love it because it shows not only uh, the, the campus, you know, where, where the actual people lived and worked and played, but it shows all of the infrastructure that helped, uh, that, that allowed Pilgrim, like every other mental institution in the country, to be a self-contained, self-sufficient society. So at the top, you've got... Um, you know, the power plant, the bakery, the laundry, all the, the infrastructure that for, for, you know, the daily needs. Over to the, um, the, the top left here, that was a doctor's community because all the doctors and their families, including the superintendent, lived on the grounds. Uh, on the lower left, you had the farm. They even had a piggery because they grew all their own food. You had a water res reservoir. You even had a, your own train station. The, uh, the Long Island Railroad would come out on the weekends and bring people out from the city. And of course, on the, uh, on the lower right here, you had the cemetery where they, because with 14,000 people, you had approximately one death per day. Well, in 2002, um, I had uh, I just finished my first book, and I was in desperate need of a new creative project to fill the void. And, and I was talking to a friend, and he said, well, you know, he, he kind of knew my interest um, as an architect. I have an interest in infrastructure and abandoned buildings. 
And he says, well, why don't you do mental hospitals? You know, they're all abandoned, and I, I'd never been to one. So uh, I drove out to, uh, to Pilgrim one day. Didn't really know quite where it was, but the directions, you know, online, it just said, you can see it from the highway. And sure enough, after about an hour, I saw these buildings poking above the trees, and it was obvious that this old institution it didn't quite fit in with the surroundings. Um, it even had its own exit. And all of a sudden, I found myself on this street, just like you see here, uh, and the, st the streets were quiet, the buildings were, were shuttered, uh, patients were gone. Uh, a small part of the campus was still in use, but it was painfully obvious how underutilized it was. Well, Pilgrim State Hospital was just one of many institutions in the uh, New York State system. And New York State, uh, because it's a large state, it had the largest mental health system in the country. In the 1950s, they had uh, over 100,000 people in 27 institutions. Now, these were not just, you know, state hospitals like we think of today. They were also state schools for, the, uh, for juvenile delinquents. They were state schools for the mentally retarded. They were epileptic colonies. Um, if you were deaf, dumb, or blind, you might find yourself in an institution. If you were, you know, senile and elderly, you could be put in an institution. The point is, is that the definition of mental, mental illness, you know, way into the 50s was very broad. And even like in the 19th century, um, you could be committed for being depressed or having hysteria. Even if you masturbated too much, you could be, you could be uh, committed. Um, the, the point is, is that, is that kind of social norms were, were reflected in the definition of mental illness. Now, what's interesting about all these institutions is that the, the cost to run this whole system was over one quarter of the state's annual budget. Uh, and I remember finding that, and I, I couldn't believe it, but, you know, it was repeated, and given, you know, today's debate on health care, uh, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> well, New York was obviously not alone in providing for the care of the mentally ill. Um, there were uh, hospitals all over the country. And in 1840, there were just 13 of these asylums, as they were known back then. In 1880, that number had jumped to 139. And... Um, you know, even through the Depression, World War II, despite fiscal uh, economic shortages, they continued to build these hospitals, and they continued to fill up. And basically, after a state would build its first hospital, all the other hospitals after that were built to meet existing needs, uh, not future ones. Ultimately, uh, before the, around the peak in the mid-50s, when there were over half a million people um, institutionalized, there were almost 300 of these hospitals all over the country. So at one time, you know, mental hospitals were, were quite a prominent feature on the American landscape. And the, the catalyst for their creation was this school teacher turned reformer named Dorothea Dix. And she lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it all started when she visited an almshouse one day, and she saw the wretched conditions in which the mentally ill were, were being lumped in with, with beggars, criminals, vagrants. And she couldn't believe how horribly they were being treated. So she took it upon herself to crusade all over the country. She spent the rest of her life doing this, petitioning state legislatures to build actual institutions for the insane. Well, um, her appeals were persuasive, but they are also well-timed because America, you know, in the 1840s, really wanted, it needed, um, uh, you know, these, these establishments, these institutions to kind of buttress the social order. They would be seen as, as models of an enlightened society. And so you had this proliferation not only of asylums, but prisons, uh, universities and you know and public schools. They were um, um, so you know the, the motives were not entirely altruistic, but you know at the heart uh, the intentions were, were quite good. Well, if um, if Dorothea Dix was the catalyst, and it was this man Thomas Story Kirkbride who provided the blueprint for their expansion, and he was the superintendent of the Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane in Philadelphia. And he was a very skilled administrator. He was more of like an administrator than a, a doctor in the modern sense of the word. And based on his, his uh, you know, work as a, as a superintendent and his travels abroad, he devised plans for the model asylum, which was, which was codified in this book, uh, which it's a long title, I won't pronounce it, but it was, um, it was published in 1854 and again in 1880. Now, the important thing about this book is that it was adopted by these original 13 men. Now, why am I showing this slide? It's because these were the other 13 superintendents of, the, of, of these other early asylums. And they all had sort of
conflicting opinions um, on how, you know, what the cause of mental illness was. They didn't even think of it as like a, you know, as a, having, having a scientific basis. So they had all these conflicting theories, but they were all superintendents. And their organization, which um, I have to actually refer to my uh, notes here, was called um, the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane. Now, why are these guys important? They're important because this organization that they had <coughs> grew into the current APA, the American Psychiatric Association. So these were the first 13 psychiatrists. And by adopting this book, by adopting this model asylum, um, they were sort of giving their new profession kind of the stamp of legitimacy. And, and as, the, uh, as the profession of psychiatry spread around the country, so too did these massive asylums as it became publicly accepted that lunacy could only be cured in the buildings. Well, um, obviously, the building itself was, was the cornerstone of this philosophy. And, and Kirkbride and his peers really believed that, uh, that a beautiful building like this, um, uh, situated on, in kind of a remote, bucolic setting, could heal mental illness. And the idea was, was that they would take the afflicted, you know, someone from the city, and <clears throat> place them in this idyllic environment, give them uh, structured activity under this strong tutelage of a, of a paternal but, you know, strict superintendent, and that they would actually uh, get better. Um, and this concept was known as moral treatment. The cornerstone of moral treatment was, of course, this massive asylum building. Uh, this structure, I think, was actually in use until last year. It's just outside of, of New York City in New Jersey, and uh, this, this, this building, this plan shaped like a shallow V or a row of birds in flight, was known as the Kirkbride Plan. The step back arrangement was done to facilitate light, air, ventilation, uh, views to the outside. It was also done for segregation and control of the patients. Um, you, could, you could classify, uh, you, could, you could organize the patients according to class, race, illness, sex, and the idea was that the male patients would be on one side and the females would be on the other. And the most disturbed patients would be in these outer wards here. And as you got better, you would move to the center. And in the center was where the offices were. It's also where, where the superintendent and the staff lived on the upper floors. Surrounding these early asylums were these gardens. Uh, and the gardens were tended for, of course, by the patients. This was part of their work therapy. They were also designed by, by some famous landscape architects. Uh, the same guy, Frederick Law Olmsted, who did Central Park in New York City, he did, he kind of practiced, he worked out his craft on these asylum grounds. So in a sense, the great city parks that we have today, you know, the, the, the ancestors of these are the, the asylum grounds. Beyond that, were hundreds and hundreds of acres of farmland. Um, this notion of self-sufficiency was inherent in the beginning of these asylums. And so patients would spend their days working out in the fields, uh, growing the food, tending to, it, to whatever needed to be tended to. And um, uh, it's very rare, you know, in state hospitals that they still owned all this land. But, um, you know, occasionally you can see markers, uh, you know, sometimes these lands have become uh, enveloped by the suburbs or they've been taken over by other farmers. But you won't see this now. You'll see mostly just the building and maybe the gardens around it. Um, the, the Kirkbride plan was, uh, and these asylums were, was, was really an American invention. And they, it gave rise to some of the largest buildings of their time. These structures really had no comparison. You know, there weren't large government buildings. There weren't museums. Uh, there weren't really big train stations. What you see here is actually only one half of these asylums uh, completed. It's in rural Minnesota near the South Dakota border. And, and what's unique about this photograph is that, you know, this is the way it looked, and this is the way it must have looked to some farmer, you know, who'd never even been to a city. Uh, you know, seeing this thing rising out of the landscape must have really, you know, blown these people away. Uh, but what's also interesting is that you can't see this now because all the trees that were later planted have grown up. So this is, it really looks like this, you know, they plop this building down on this, this barren landscape. Well, like, um, uh, as, as, you, as you can see in the book, um, the, the Kirkbride plan was not only this building typology, but it was, it was a truly modern uh, a technological marvel of its time. It had fireproof construction. It had indoor plumbing, heating, ventilation, all these things that we take for granted now. But, you know, back before the Civil War, it was pretty, you know, pretty uncommon. 
But, you know, for all of its technical advances, the interiors of these early asylums were really nothing more than dormitories with all the accoutrements of, you know, the, the typical Victorian home. And remember that the, the essence of moral treatment was the, the paternal superintendent and his family of patients. Also, the medical diagnoses back then weren't very advanced either. Um, in, in my research, uh, you know, I, t I would take a lot of photos, but I also would dig through a lot of these old archives in the hospitals, uh, not knowing what to find. And this is from uh, uh, South Dakota or something, you know, before it was even a state. But you can see it wasn't very advanced, what, what they were diagnosing. Um, and really, you know, the, the main uh, function of a lot of these asylums was just kind of keep, pe keep people safe um, and secluded, keep them uh, safe from the public, but also safe from themselves. And so, you know, they had night watchmen go around uh, seeing if everyone was asleep. Well, the, um, you know, before the, the asylums became objects of derision, they were sources of great civic pride, believe it or not. And uh, these are some old postcards that were uh, lent to me for this, for my book. Um, you can see how huge these places were, how grand they were, and how this one plan that was contained in this guy's book was replicated all over the country. Uh, you might expect this in the east, but you know you had it, you know, all over the all over the place. Um, the top, that top there, that's that's Provo, Utah. This bottom here is Napa Valley, California. This is a huge one in in, in Milledgeville, in Georgia. Um, everywhere, you know, where you least expect it. Many of these buildings, of course, uh, are now gone. So uh, they exist only in postcards and old photographs. They were also tourist attractions. You know, if, if you went to one of these towns, what are you going to do? You're going to go check out the asylum and, and write home about it. And I found these cards that, you know, would say, and these are not patients, they would say, I'm going to go, you know, visit this today. And that's because the grounds, uh, you know, were, were, were public grounds. You could, you know, you could go enjoy the gardens. Well, like any lofty ideal, the Kirkbride plan and moral treatment failed to live up to uh, their expectations. The, uh, the hospitals, as soon as they opened, they became inundated with all types of people, uh, you know, foreign-born, um, uh, the poor, senile elderly, elements that would never get any better. And, uh, and, you know, also moral treatment had an inherent racial and class bias. So, uh, you know, and th people didn't start to get better, and state legislatures got impatient. You know, the success rates kind of dwindled, and they withdrew funding, which, of course, meant, um, you know, high turnover rates, low wages, uh, abuses, uh, bureaucratic corruption. You know, you can kind of figure out what happened next. And so the pendulum of care began to swing from the curative to the custodial. And yet, this model of asylums uh, continued to be uh, built up until the turn of the 20th century. And uh, at the top here we have this original, that's the original one for 250 patients, which is, you know, it's kind of manageable. At the bottom, this is Buffalo State Hospital. That building, it's one building and it was over a third of a mile long. Uh, and at that, you know, at that scale, you really can't maintain any kind of a personal relationship. So. The question, you know, why did these buildings persist if they didn't really work anymore? Well, it's because they represented the status quo. They were a convenient solution. You know, they, they became these big warehouses. Uh, also, some of these older superintendents, you know, who weren't modern doctors, who were, you know, more like administrators, didn't want to give up their cherished big buildings. You know, this was kind of, kind of the perks, the benefits of the job. And so they saw it as, as an affront to their profession, to their older profession, that people would want to actually, you know, let patients be treated in smaller, uh, more, more nondescript buildings. The third is that, you know, buildings of this size that are a third of a mile long, they don't just get built in a year. They take decades to build. And Buffalo State Hospital took almost 30 years. This is a shot of Buffalo State Hospital that I took at night. I think they closed it in the 80s, and uh, they put a fence up around it, lit it up at night, and so I was able to go there and shoot it. But that just gives you an idea. That's, that's just the main administration building where the staff lived. So that's sort of what you saw, you know, when, when, you, when you entered. And, uh, you know, Kirkbride and his peers, these early architects, they didn't have a lot of medicine to work with. They had, uh, uh, you know, things to sedate the patients, opiates. But they, they knew that they really were looking, working with a limited palate. And... Um, but they knew the, the power and the propaganda of architecture and the environment. This is kind of a side of that, and that's kind of, you know, your classic asylum. It looks more like a castle. Well, around the turn of the century, a couple of interesting things happened. As psychiatry became more tied to uh, mainstream medicine, 
uh, it became apparent that you didn't need these large buildings. And so finally, this huge plan was broken up into little pieces, and you have the cottage plan. And so later state hospitals of the 20th century look more like cottage ca uh, college campuses. The other interesting thing which I found was, was pretty cool is that the name Insane Asylum, Lunatic Asylum, Asylum in general was dropped across the country and they changed the name to State Hospital in, a, in, a, in an effort to kind of align themselves more with mainstream medicine. And so to this day, if you go online or if you see you know, State Hospital on a map or a sign, it doesn't mean a general hospital run by the state, it means a mental hospital. And so these later hospitals, you know, don't really look like uh, the kind of the gothic Victorian asylums we think of. This is in New England. Um, you know, looks like uh, anything, a prep school or something. This is out in, uh, in California. It looks like a typical college campus. This looks like a, uh, a factory. This is, in, this is in Michigan. And there's a reason for this. The architect who did this designed a lot of the big um, uh, automobile factories in Detroit. So even though you had this shift in architecture, the shift in design, they still functioned along the same lines as self-contained cities. So you, and you had this, this notion of self-sufficiency, um, which began in the 1850s all the way up through the, the 1960s and even early 70s. So these huge organizations, they were like you know, big companies. They kind of lumbered along, and they didn't really change much. Well. By the 1950s, um, with the introduction of psychotropic drugs, uh, changes in commitment laws, and a shift towards community-based care, uh, you saw a decrease uh, of patient population. And slowly, you know, in came the era of the institutionalization. You also had a series of these federal laws in the 1970s. And once they were passed, they forbade the use of patient labor unless the patients were paid minimum wage. What this did was deprive the hospitals of their precious supply, their precious workforce, and literally overnight, the patients could no longer go to work in the shops and the farms. And so uh, the hospitals began to close one by one. And although today uh, no state has yet to close all of its state hospitals, they, of course, are no longer seen as the cutting edge of mental health care. Um, they're seen as a last resort. Uh, stays are no longer numbered in months and years or decades. They're, they're, they're numbered in usually days uh, by days and weeks. So that's kind of where, <coughs> that's kind of how I found these places, uh, empty, uh, ghost towns. And after my first day, you know, at Pilgrim, I drove home and I'm thinking, you know, who would build such a place? I mean, it was just, it was enormous. But then who, why would it be abandoned? And so in the weeks following, I started to explore the New York City area, and I found the same thing over and over again. Some of the hospitals were completely abandoned, like this one in West Virginia. You know, gradually, I started going up to New England, out to the Midwest. Uh, I got hooked pretty quickly. And so I found, you know, places that looked like they were out of, uh, you know, the European French countryside down in West Virginia, uh, places that were even earlier than some of those Kirk brides that looked like Greek temples. Uh, and then occasionally, I would come across, you know, an ancient pre-Civil War building, totally abandoned, next to a fully functioning modern state hospital. And what had happened is that they would just gradually remove the patients, you know, either release them uh, off and out onto the street, uh, or bring them into the new facility, and they would just let these older buildings deteriorate because, as we all know, there's not a lot of money invested in, in mental health care. This is an interior. So um, a lot of times I would find these, uh, these interiors which hadn't really you know, been renovated. They were really intact because they never had any money to modernize them. So what I did pr pretty quickly early on was get permission from all these, uh, you know, the state, uh, the departments, the head, the head offices. And I was kind of hesitant because I'm thinking, you know, the last thing they want is bad publicity. Photographers going in. And to my surprise, they, they welcomed me because they valued their history, their, 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 their buildings, um, at, you know, a lot. And they, they really, un they, they thought that, you know, these places were, were misunderstood and misrepresented. And so, um, you know, having a, a book out kind of helped it open the door. But um, I was really surprised that once the project got going, I, I pretty much got in everywhere I wanted to go. And, you know, a lot of times I would show up and maybe they'd give me an escort. Sometimes they would just give me a set of skeleton keys and a walkie-talkie and say, you know, have fun, check in with us. Um, and I remember one time uh, I arrived over a holiday weekend and I met with the facilities manager. You know, he showed me around in his pickup truck and then he literally gave me the walkie-talkie to the, you know, the security and, and the keys and he said, you know, this will open everything you need. Have fun, you know, drop the keys uh, when you leave and, and good luck. 
Um, so when when one when one entered um, a hospital for the first time, let's say you're you know you're the public or whatever, you would you would usually come upon this grand lobby. You know, this is like the, the public entrance. This is the face they want to put on the good face because you know you couldn't venture too far back into the wards. But it was usually it was actually the wards which which were the heart of these early asylums. Um, you know, I talked about dormitories. That's really what they were. All those step back pavilions, just one ward on top of another. And the first thing you notice, um, aside from the kind of the crazy colors, is how wide these hallways are. And that is because patients were expected to, you know, once they got up in the morning, they couldn't just hang out in the bedrooms. They actually had to be social and hang out in the hallways or in the lounges or in the dining rooms if they weren't working outside. And so the wards really were the, uh, the focal point of activity. Um, Another thing that struck me was, you know, even though these places became warehouses, one, ha one can't help but admire all that mosaic on the floor, you know. And if they wanted them just to be warehouses, they wouldn't have put this much care into building them. So I was kind of always struck by that. No matter where I went, there was always this wonderful attention to detail in the architecture, even when it wasn't necessary. Um, so... A lot of these wards look alike, you know, because they were based on the same model. And there's this, there's this procession, this rigid symmetry of doors. And, and you realize that, you know, they're not only uh, designed that way to encourage kind of social interaction, but they're also done that way for, you know, control uh, and keeping order. And so, you know, on their own, they're just hallways, but I realized that they were actually symbols of, of these closed worlds. And so what I would do when I went to a hospital, um, just to kind of get my head into a space to get, because, you know, these places were huge, I would always set my camera up sort of in this one spot in the back and take the same shot, knowing that at some time, sometime later, I could kind of compile them into a slideshow and, you know, you could see all these places one after another and see really how similar they were. A lot of the hospitals I visited um, were in pretty tough shape as the patients were let out, you know, beginning in the 50s and 60s, they would abandon these huge outer wards. And so these outer wards, it would get kind of worse and worse the farther you went deeper into the hospital. And I could, I could literally be in, a, in an office, you know, like this, heated room, well lit, ventilated, cheery, you know, little posters on the wall. And then there's this door. And right next, right beyond that door, you, you would open into a hallway like this, you know, gray, crumbling. The, uh, the heating had turned, been turned off long ago, and the temperature would be, would be dropped like 30 degrees. The, the difference was, 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 like, was like night and day. Occasionally, I would come across these uh, you know, forensic wards, wards for the criminally insane. Uh, this is kind of what we all imagine, you know, the heavy doors with the screens and all that. Um, in Louisiana, I found this, is, uh, this was actually, uh, uh, it's now a prison, um, but the building was, you know, it really was just... In, in its heyday, it actually was a, 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 a you know, hospital for the, for the criminally insane. Like I said, the, um, the conditions of the hospitals uh, were, were often left the way you know, they had been in the, in the 40s or 30s. And so, as an architect, it was incredible walking into these interiors with these you know, tin ceilings, uh, old light fixtures, old chairs, everything kind of left the way it was. Here's a bedroom, a patient's bedroom. Um, you know, you'd never see this now. You'd never see uh, a little delicate glass light fixture, a bed like that, a push-button switch, um, that, that ancient, you know, skeleton key um, uh, handle on the door. And this was probably used uh, up until the 60s or even early 70s. All state hospitals, all patient bedrooms had these cool windows um, on the doors, little observation windows. This was one of the better ones that I saw. If the, if the patient accommodations were kind of modest in these bedrooms or dormitory settings, the superintendent had these sumptuous uh, quarters above the, in, in the main building. This is, in, this is in Minnesota. So this is quite a wonderful apartment. And it, oftentimes, you know, the superintendents no longer lived on the grounds. And so they would just vacate these upper floors and turn the elevator key off. But they would still use the offices below. I got to go all over these hospitals, you know, in the buildings, on the grounds, and they were all connected by these elaborate tunnel systems, which were, which were pretty cool. And, you know, there are certain, sh certain shots that I knew kind of existed that I was, I was waiting to find, and sure enough, I found this one with this uh, diverging, uh, you know, perspective lines in Iowa at 1 a.m. when it wasn't in use. Another common feature of state hospitals would be these screen porches. Um, wherever patients lived, they always had... 
uh, screen porches where the patients would go and hang out, smoke a cigarette. You know, and like the wards, like the interiors, you look at these outsides and, uh, you know, they seem really creepy. And you're like, oh, what, you know, what, what, what went on in there? And then you look inside and all it is is really just, it's just a porch with chairs. And you're kind of, it kind of dawned on me many times how boring and mundane it must have been, you know, to pass away your days in one of these places, especially, you know, uh, after the days when you couldn't work on the farm or when you, didn't, when you couldn't really do anything. Another common feature were these enclosed stairwells. Every stairwell in a state hospital had to be enclosed to prevent patients uh, from jumping. This place was interesting because this is where they filmed uh, the Cider House Rules, and so I think to get some of the movie equipment up, they took off that the banister there on the left. But this is a more ornate response to, you know, uh, uh, keeping a stairwell safe. Here they just put this kind of boxy screen around this wonderful spiral stair. Here there's, these are just uh, two-by-fours from a, a place in South Carolina. And of course, you know, the shot with all the peeling paint and, and a much more uh, austere uh, screen. This is from uh, Milledgeville in, in Georgia. And, uh, you know, the conditions would vary greatly. You know, some hospitals just kind of looked like they were falling apart. Others were completely open to the sky. Sometimes the floors would be caved in, and I could stand over the edge of this and kind of look down two or three stories because all the floors had pancaked. And yet, just next door, you might find a room that looked like this. You know, pretty good shape. All you got to do is, is uh, scrape off the paint and, and dust it with a broom. That's because the walls were often two feet thick, masonry, very solid. So, you know, it was like, really was like night and day. You never knew what to expect. Sometimes, you know, these rooms would be in immaculate condition, and they'd have these, you know, kind of hydrotherapy tubs in them. Occasionally, I found uh, artifacts, uh, toothbrushes. These are patient toothbrushes, which we found in the back, in the sort of the deepest uh, depths of this hospital that was completely abandoned. Uh, these things were very rare. You know, anything that can be moved or taken that are that's worth anything usually grows legs and walks away. Uh, but we found this, and you know, it was it was a great joy being a photographer to capture something which is kind of inherently beautiful for its own sake, but. Uh, it was also quite sad because you, you uh, over a period of like two hours when I took the shot, you begin to um, reflect on the lives of the patients and, you know, what happened to them, why did they leave their kind of most personal belongings behind. And I also felt a great sadness for the buildings because you realize that um, just as the, the, these people were abandoned, so too now are these buildings. This was a, another rare find in Tennessee. These are patient suitcases. And, you know, when you arrived at a hospital, you bring your belongings. You bring a suitcase. So these suitcases would be stored up in an attic and often forgotten. Uh, this was another shot like that tunnel shot you saw that I knew existed somewhere. It was just a matter of finding it. And sure enough, uh, poking around uh, one day with my escort, we, we found these suitcases which had been there for decades. Another common sight, um, you know, most of the rooms were usually empty, but occasionally they'd be filled with boxes and boxes of just, like, files. And one, you can begin to appreciate, you know, the enormous bureaucracy that it took to keep these places going uh, and kind of how pointless it all is. You know, once something's filed away, stored away, it's never going to be used again. These are cushions uh, from a hospital in Texas. Once again, lots of pastel colors, which were believed to have uh, soothing effects on the patients. And um, as hospitals were downsized, they would often take, you know, the contents of all these buildings and consolidate them, let's say, into an old dining hall, which is what this was. And here, you could take inventory of a hospital in its heyday. Uh, lots of cool medical equipment, dentist equipment, you know, everything. And... Uh, you know, these are, you know, these are like antiques, and often they would just get um, either auctioned off or, or, you know, sent to the dump. Hospitals, state hospitals, because of their immense size, their infrastructure, their remote location, uh, their, their self-sufficiency, made ideal fallout shelters. So in the basement of this place, the guard, you know, just opens the door, and here are these uh, civil defense supplies from the Cold War, from 1964 unopened until I opened them and arranged them for this photograph, but pretty much in perfect condition. Um, very cool stuff. 
Well, as much fun as I had, you know, poking around the insides of the buildings, finding things, um, I really loved going outside because as the buildings had fallen in on themselves over the past century, the grounds had actually become more beautiful. All the trees had grown up and matured. And so I would often find myself, you know, in a hospital that might have been originally intended for thousands of people. Maybe they now only had 30 people. And so these grounds would be empty, and I could just walk around them. Uh, it was very distracting. But, you know, there's really, there's really no way to convey that sense of beauty uh, on, on film. And, of course, uh, over time, I became less and less interested in the architecture. Uh, these buildings kind of all look the same after a while, you know. And what impressed me was the community that all these structures would create. You know, it, thousands of people lived, worked, and died at these hospitals. And so I thought it much more interesting, you know, to find these, these quads, these sort of gardens where people would actually used to congregate. So this was, um, this was actually an, an epileptic colony in Maryland. Uh, this was a, a courtyard, you know, in one of these old hospitals. And as these Kirkbrides would be expanding, you know, they couldn't keep going out. They would kind of often wrap in on themselves and create these sort of secret gardens, like this one here. This is a, another kind of garden that you can't see from the street with the gazebo. This is a place where patients would hang out and smoke cigarettes, completely overgrown now, of course. Well, um, if there was one thing that interested me more than anything else, it was this notion of self-sufficiency. You know, the idea of uh, people growing their own food, making their own clothing, making their own shoes. You know, it's, it's like this foreign concept now. You know, we don't know, we don't really know where our clothing comes from. We don't know how things are made anymore. We certainly don't grow our, our own food. So I found this, you know, it seemed to speak of a much more environmentally sustainable way of life. And, uh, you know, rem kind of reminded me of what, what my grandparents used to tell me. And so what would happen is that, you know, I would, I would call up a, a superintendent's office 1,500 miles away, and I'd say, I'd like to come out and see your hospital. Do you have anything that's kind of left that's still intact? And, you know, they'd give me a whole spiel and say, there's lots of old buildings to come photograph, and you should definitely come visit us. And so, you know, often I would drive for a couple days to get to a place, not really knowing what I was going to find. Of course, the person showing me around had no idea that they were going to get assigned me that day. And, uh, you know, I'd show up at 8.30 in the morning, and I'd be meeting some guy in the, in the facilities department who'd worked there his whole life. His parents had worked there before him. You know, he drove a pickup truck, and uh, we'd get in his truck, and he'd kind of look at me and say, uh, so you're, you're here to do photography? You're from New York City? Is that it? Uh, and he's looking at me with a little bit of suspicion, curiosity. You know, why would I want to come out here and photograph these, these barns that are falling apart? And all I had to do was just say, well, I'm really interested in self-sufficiency. And their eyes, their eyes would light up. And even before I kind of had to prod them to that, you know, that direction, the first thing they would say, well, you, you know, these places were like, you know, self-contained cities, right? And it was, it was so kind of, Interesting, you know, hearing someone that I didn't know talk about something on such a philosophical level, like they, they got it right away. Um, and the stories that these guys would tell me, they were all the same. I mean, I went to hospitals in Maine, Alabama, Oregon, the Midwest. Every story was identical. And I never told them that because I never really got tired of listening to it. But the way they would make the campuses come alive and, and talk about, you know, what it was like uh, you know, maybe their, their father had run the farm, what it was like to grow up on the property. You know, these patients, uh, they, these people were their friends. Um, these, these were their homes. And so I found, you know, interesting that once you got on the campus, the stigma of mental illness, uh, of anything, just kind of disappeared. So, uh, and my one regret was not actually uh, taping a lot of these, these conversations, these impromptu conversations. At the time, I was just mostly worried about, you know, am I going to find anything to shoot because I've just, you know, driven you know, taking a week off work to drive out to the middle of nowhere. But um, usually I found something interesting. And, uh, and so it was my intention to kind of assemble uh, parts from each hospital. Uh, a dairy farm from New Jersey, uh, a calf barn from South Dakota, uh, root cellar vents from Pennsylvania. I didn't even know what a root cellar was until I went to a state hospital. And by by kind of bringing all of this together, not only the architecture, but the infrastructure, the interiors, the artifacts, I could recreate kind of a typical state hospital in its heyday. And so this infrastructure, you know, I never got tired of, of seeing these things because every hospital kind of had something different. These are sauerkraut vats 
from Pennsylvania. You know, I, I don't even like sauerkraut, so I never even thought about how it was made. <laughs> this is a slaughterhouse uh, in uh, Broughton, North Carolina. Um, you know, and oftentimes, these are very modest structures. They're on the periphery. A lot of times, by the time I get there, the guards working, they didn't even know they existed, you know. They, so we'd have to drive out in the woods, talk to an old-timer, and we'd find something that, they, that many, many people had thought uh, long since had been, you know, overgrown. This was a, a fish hatchery in, in Illinois. Obviously, the, the ponds have long since been filled in, but the, the portal remains. Interesting that the governor... Um, his name is on there, and that makes you realize that these state hospitals were kind of like fiefdoms for, for the governors. You know, there was a lot of uh, um, uh, patronage going on. This is a power plant. You know, they all produce their own power. Boilers, huge boilers. You know, every place I went to had all of this. It was just a matter of what was still standing when I got there. This is a water reservoir from Pennsylvania. Sewage treatment plant, which, you know, you don't really know it's a sewage treatment plant now, but it makes for a, a very uh, kind of evocative photograph. Fire truck, they all had their own uh, fire stations with uh, lots of old fire trucks. Many of them probably didn't work by the time I saw them. And they also had their own zip codes, many of them, you know, since they were like towns. Owned bakeries, baked their own food. This is where they made shoes. And a lot of the things in this shoe shop dated from the 1940s. You know, there are old newspapers lining the drawers from 1940. And it's astounding that, that this stuff, they just kind of walked away. Right next door to that was the mattress shop, because they always had to repair and make new mattresses. These are mattress springs. They made their own dresses out of, um, you know, curtains or, or whatever was, was, was available. This is uh, the straight jackets. And, you know, nowadays, you know, we can order all this stuff online. There's, you know, companies that make this stuff. But back then, they had to make all this themselves. Uh, and so every place I went, they had, like, a different version of, of a straight jacket. These are multicolored ones from, uh, from, from North Dakota. Uh, basically, um, you know, we hear about all the bad things. But, they're, but basically, all of the, the amenities of the outside world were replicated within and they kind of did the best they could. This is a beauty salon. You know, what better way to feel good about yourself than getting your hair done? So you have beauty salons. You had uh, barber shops. You had bowling alleys. These were really popular. Bowling shoes. You know, and what I'm showing you, it's all from different places around the country. And then you had these huge, these huge theaters because they used to have uh, state hospital bands. They used to put on plays. You know, patients were expected to participate. And so uh, you had this, you know, these enormous, enormous theaters. These are like the size of Broadway theaters in New York. This one's cool because it's got this uh, asbestos fire curtain back when asbestos was, was a, a technological marvel of its day. And occasionally, of course, you know, I would find operating rooms. Now, by the, you know, early 20th century, as the asylums became state hospitals and they became more uh, tied to mainstream medicine, well, they, they actually were hospitals. And so um, uh, occasionally I would find the operating rooms on the top floors of these buildings. You know, usually the operating rooms were on the top floors because that's where the best light is. And so uh, as, as is the case with that superintendent's quarters, they would turn off uh, the key in the elevator and lock that floor. And so the guard would take me up there, unlock that key, and all of a sudden, you know, you walk into this operating room that is ready to go. Probably hadn't been used, you know, since the 80s. Uh, this is a urological x-ray suite. Same thing, top floor that was locked. And as hospitals downsized, um, you know, these kind of functions were handed over to general hospitals uh, and patients, you know, wouldn't receive medical treatment on site. This is a hydrotherapy room. This is kind of a vestige of a less enlightened era. This is kind of what we think of when we think of old asylums. And, and actually, I didn't see too many of these. We, these were usually ripped out long before I got there. But you can kind of ask yourself, you know, how much would that 16-head that uh, or 20-head shower uh, go for nowadays with the marble and copper? I mean, this is something that would, that would not be cheap. This is an ECT unit from Nebraska. And, you know, normally, um, you know, when I was putting together this book, I, I did a lot of research and I, I uncovered 
uh, wonderful pictures of people making things, you know, this whole self-sufficient thing, all the, the cool architectural postcards. And, you know, I also saw, I also found a lot of very disturbing images, you know, people uh, just kind of sitting around, you know, with the, the, the warehouse idea. Uh, there was a lot of that. And I, I tried to insert a few of those into the book, and I felt that it just kind of destroyed the whole rhythm of everything, destroyed the story I was trying to tell. But I did want to show a few artifacts, and I'm showing this one today. Um, this was kind of the standard ECT unit that you would have had, you know, in the late 50s and early 60s um, for electrosho electroshock therapy. And I found this same unit kind of at many hospitals, but this was the best one I found. And I received an email a couple weeks ago from, from a guy, uh, and I, I receive, often receive emails because the, the book provokes kind of certain responses from people um, where they recall some, some relative that was, uh, that was committed. And at the end of the email, the guy was saying that his grandmother had been committed at Lincoln State Hospital and that it, he was, you know, flipping through the book, recalling, you know, visiting her or whatever, and he came to this image and he realized that this was probably the same unit that had treated his grandmother. Uh, so that kind of, you know, really blew me away because, you know, when I'm shooting these things, my focus is really on, you know, trying to get a shot that kind of conveys a story, uh, but I certainly don't know all of its history. And it's wonderful to have people uh, bring that back. This is a shot that I never show, but since I'm at uh, med school, I figured I would. This is, um, you know, the uh, uh, tools used for uh, lobotomies. Uh, not very scientific, but, um, you know, and this is, you know, people say, oh, did you see where they did the lobotomies? And, you know, that happened so long ago, and equipment like this, you know, it wasn't just lying around. It's not like I just opened a drawer and, and found these things. If they were still there, they would be in a museum. Probably the coolest place I saw was this autopsy theater in Washington, D.C. And I remember it was kind of towards the end of my project, and I was having a hard time finding something that interested me at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in D.C. And it's this massive, massive hospital. One campus, one side is completely abandoned. The other side is still in use. Uh, and, the, and the guy who shot Reagan, I forget his name, President Reagan, is still living there. And so, uh, of course, I had to be escorted by you know, a police officer the whole time. And I said, you know, I'm just not, I'm not finding anything. And he just kind of stood there, scratched his chin a little bit, and he said, I think I know what you're going to like. And we went to this laboratory and down into the basement, and he just opened this door, and here was this, you know, autopsy theater with the tiered seating, uh, the, the, you know, the saw, um, even the knife sharpener in the back. I mean, everything was there, uh, the drawers, the morgue drawers, everything was there fully intact, fully working, and it's because they still use the laboratory upstairs. Now, places like this were, where, well, were rare, but um, in these bigger state hospitals that were close to cities and universities, they were often centers of research. So if you went upstairs in this laboratory, you had a whole hallway full of these uh, brain autopsy specimens from the early 20th century. Now, you know, I didn't really know... Um, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I didn't really know much about the diseases, but they talked about, you know, the kinds of, of people, you know, who, who these people were who had died there. And, uh, and they were pretty old. You know, one of these was a, was a Civil War veteran, a crusty Civil War veteran, as they described him. So, uh, you know, seeing things like this was, was pretty rare, but you realize that, you know, in their heyday, at their very best, they were centers of, of scientific research. Of course, people died all the time at these hospitals. You know, they were warehouses, uh, and a lot of senile elderly uh, were lived here. This is before, you know, the, the days of Medicare and Medicaid, when, when it became convenient for state hospitals, state agencies, to move the, the aged infirm over to resting homes because that was how they could get, they could did that because the federal government could foot the bill. So you had a lot of these moors. This is from Pilgrim. This is the hospital all the way in the beginning, the largest one in the world. And it says, let conversation cease, let laughter flee. This is the place where death delights to help the living. I don't know who wrote that, but it was definitely pretty creepy. <laughs> this is, a, uh, this is a, a coffin which was used to transport bodies from you know, the wards uh, to this ice house, which is on the grounds of the cemetery in upstate New York. And... Um, it's kind of poignant for, se for several reasons. You know, it's about death, but in the back are these unused grave markers. So that gives you a sense of how many people were buried in the cemetery. So what they would do is they'd bring these bodies out and they would store them on ice in the background, in that back room, because they couldn't bury them in the winter. Those lists on the wall are 
uh, the years for the years in 1975 through 77, those are the last years the cemetery was used. And I found it kind of uh, interesting how they are divided into three columns. So you have numbers for three columns. Uh, and it says J, R, C, and P for Jewish, Roman Catholic, and Protestant. So even in death they were kind of divided. This is a plot plan of a cemetery in Texas. This is a typical state hospital cemetery. The markers, um, you know, people didn't get headstones with their names on it. They got just markers usually flush with the ground with a number on it. These are <coughs> unclaimed cremation urns from uh, uh, Oregon State Hospital in Salem, Oregon. Copper urns. And uh, I knew right away I saw these on a front page of the New York Times one Monday morning, a close-up, and I knew right away what they were. I'd never seen it, but I just, you know, you just kind of know what something is. And I called the superintendent up that morning, and I said, i got to come out here and shoot these because, you know, there is nothing like them. And you could tell the weight uh, or the size of the person, their age, you know, if they were a child or an old, old person, by the weight of the can. And here's a shot of a cemetery. Um, one, one thing which was touching, you know, the, 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 they, the, the grounds people, these uh, state hospitals, you know, working with, you know, uh, minuscule budgets, and so they didn't have a lot of money to maintain the property, but they would often go to great lengths to maintain and reclaim the cemeteries, uh, you know, from Mother Nature. A lot of times the cemeteries would be off, you know, in the fields or in the woods somewhere, and, you know, a few decades pass and you don't even know it's a cemetery. I was visiting one place in uh, Tennessee, and it was an African-American American, uh, uh, hospital, and there was um, this burial ground, and you, the only way you could tell that the graves were there is because the ground undulated, you know, the bodies had decomposed, and it was just this kind of, you know, it was kind of a beautiful undulation, but it was one of the most uh, peaceful, beautiful cemeteries I've ever seen, just because it was in the woods, and they had kind of found it again and opened it up. So what's happening now to these state institutions? Well, you know, after a peak in the 50s, uh, patient populations declined, and the hospitals started to close one by one. Um, so states already burdened by the budgets wanted to get rid of this surplus property. What do they do? They sell them to developers who prize the land but not the buildings. They view these historic structures as mostly as liabilities, but they see the land uh, for its, you know, this is prime real estate. You know, this hospital here uh, faces the Hudson River in upstate New York. I mean, it's, it couldn't be more beautiful. And um, so what's happening now is that a lot of these hospitals, these landmarks, uh, are being just demolished to make way for uh, condominiums. Some of the hospitals are being transferred over to other state agencies. This was Matawan State Hospital. It was a hospital for the criminally insane. So it kind of made sense. Now it is a medium security prison. Uh, obviously, to take this shot, I had to get permission. You know, they had to sniff my car, and I had to list every item I was bringing into the hospital. But once I was in, I was inside a medium security prison, which was uh, made, made a little bit difficult to focus on on this shot. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, it's kind of sad because you have these, these amazing properties, you know, just stunning. The landscapes are just are gorgeous. And it's a shame that they're either being turned over to become prisons or, uh, you know, they're being sold off so that someone else in the private uh, realm can make more money. And, of course, you know, politicians, it looks good if they close a the state hospital, they save money, you know, for in the short term. But it's a shame that these institutions can't be given back somehow to the people who really need them, you know. Certainly we don't need to put people away for decades, but we do need some kind of, you know, these, these healthy communities where people can come and, and you know, and be crazy if, if they need to be. Um, a nice thing that's happening in Queens, New York, this is Creedmoor State Hospital. Uh, this is the Living Museum. And what they've done here, a psychologist has taken over this old industrial kitchen and turned it into an art center. And this is where patients can come and do whatever they want. They can make art. And i got to say, um, you know, in all my travels around the world, uh, going, you know, to these uh, amazing archaeological sites or like St. Peter's in Rome, I walked into this place and I was almost moved to tears by how incredible it was. There was so much positive energy in, in this space and the art was, was I mean, it was really good. Uh, it was, you know, gallery quality. And what has happened is that the, this guy has let all this art sort of accrue over the past 25 years. And it's in all the rooms, you know, where they used to do all the baking, all these other rooms above, you know, upstairs. And it's just, it envelops you. And, and the light, you know, streams in. It's kind of like being in a cathedral. 
and you feel so much energy and life and happiness in there. And uh, I, you know, as an artist, I, I found it so inspiring and just and, and humbling in a way. And uh, you know, it's a shame that they can't do more of this because. Because even though we've kind of come full, you know, it seems like we've kind of come full circle. The tenets of, of moral treatment, you know, of just, you know, staying busy, you know, positive thinking, giving something someone to do that will get their mind off their troubles. You know, what better way to refocus their energies than through art and music? So, um, you know, some state hospitals, like this, like the big one in Buffalo that was a third of the mile long, that will be saved. You know, now the city has enveloped it, the land that was used for the farm behind it, is now a university. And so a city that values its history, that values its preservation, they will find another use for it, uh, for a big building like this, even if they have to mothball it for a while. But a place like this, which is on the Canadian border in New York State, won't be so lucky. You know, it's in a, it's in a blue collar town. And like many of these hospitals, the town's economy was tied to the state hospital. So when the state hospital closes, there are no jobs. And, um, you know, and so preservationists uh, are really struggling in places like this, you know, where all the stores on Main Street are closed. What are you going to do with a hospital that has more square footage than all of those stores on Main Street? And so the very qualities that made these hospitals endearing in the first place, their remote location, their massive construction, um, it has made, you know, they're, they're, they've kind of presented huge hurdles for preservationists. And the other problem is that, uh, you know, there's this stigma that's attached to mental illness, and that has been transferred to the buildings as well now. And so people see them really as, you know, vestiges of, less of a less enlightened era, and they don't engender the same nostalgia as other historic structures. Uh, and so what's unfortunate is that most people don't realize that they were, you know, originally built by leading architects, physicians, civic leaders of the day with mostly noble intentions. Uh, I'd just like to finish here with this, um, with this hospital uh, in Danvers, Massachusetts. It was probably uh, one of the greatest landmarks of the 19th century, you know, institutional architecture. And I grew up not very far from it as a child, and I remember seeing it. Uh, it was high on top of a hill, and I remember seeing it poking above the trees as I would drive up to my cousins. And it was the kind of thing that, you know, when it closed, and closed, when it, closed it inspired a lot of, you know, mystery and talk, and its reputation only grew. Um, well, of course, what happened is that uh, the state sold it to a developer um, who announced plans to tear it down, and uh, the town didn't really protest. And so I finally got permission from the developer to get in. I had to pull a few strings. And I was, you know, kind of amazed because they didn't want any publicity. They were essentially, you know, tearing down a local landmark. But I got in there about a week before it closed, and I got up to the roof, and here's a shot of, um, you know, of the roof line, and, and one can kind of imagine what it was like. You know, here you are, you come to this place in its heyday in the 19th century, and all around you is just, you know, countryside, and then maybe 20 miles to the south, there's the city of Boston. And so it was really, it couldn't have been more well-sided. It couldn't have been a more idyllic uh, landscape. Well, over a period of months, I returned to see it demolished bit by bit. And as an architect, uh, this was, you know, very, um, very, very frustrating and very sad to watch, uh, to see it torn apart bit by bit. And as if kind of to cleanse the past, uh, they, they would say they were saving the center portion to be incorporated into this condo development, but they would gut everything on the inside, save for just those two foot thick outer walls. They would take out the roof, all the floors. And I, I felt like they were trying to sanitize the building. And, you know, what people don't realize is that the power of these old asylums, their significance really lies in their ability to, uh, you know, evoke such strong uh, emotional reaction, even if it is negative. You know, it's something that we have to contend with and acknowledge and not try to erase. So over a period of months, I go back and photograph the demolition, and, I, and the, the um, you know, the, the, the building receded. It got, it got to a point where it was like, wasn't quite half full, you know, it became half empty, and it no longer what was what it, what it once had been. And these piles of stone, rubble, and brick kind of grew higher as the, uh, as the building receded. And I hesitated to <laughs> tell the site manager, you know, how disturbing it was to watch this happen, because after all, he was the one who had said, all right, you can come on site, you know, just don't get hurt. But he was the one who, you know, had finally said yes. And I didn't want to rock the boat. But I noticed that over this period of six months that I've been going up there, his uh, demeanor had kind of changed. And he wasn't the sort of positive, sprightly, you know, construction guy that I first met. He was kind of always sort of depressed when I met him. 
And um, so I told him, and he sort of said, he agreed with me completely, and he summed it up very succinctly. And I'll end with this. He said, you know, when I first uh, got this project, I, I fell in love with this place. I couldn't wait to get up here. But now without the building uh, and the trees, it's just a place like any other. So uh, on that note, I want to thank you. I'll take some uh, quick questions, if you can keep them succinct. Uh, it's been great. Thank you.